Give it up for our worship team. Amen. Well, it's great to be here. You guys excited? I love the 9 a.m. service. I'm a little bit biased towards the 9 a.m. I feel like you guys are faithful. You come every week. 9 a.m., you're excited, you're lively. Uh, in fact, I want you to give two people a high five just on e- either side of you. If someone's too far away, just give them an air five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're continuing our series uh, in Acts called Unfinished, and uh, I don't want to waste any time today. I want to make the most of the time that I have, so we're going to jump right in. And uh, I want us to look at 11 verses in Acts chapter 15. I really uh, believe this is going to be the foundation of what I want to talk to you about out of this chapter of Acts. And uh, can you guys handle 11 verses, 9 a.m. service? I said, can you handle 11 verses? Amen. Amen. Just making sure you're ready for the word of God today. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. It reads like this. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Really quick, uh, Paul and Barnabas just got back from their first missionary journey. They were sent out by the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 13 through Acts chapter 14. They're traveling around. They're spreading the message of the gospel. They're reaching many Gentiles. God is really moving. And they come back and they're reporting the good news. And right as we start off Acts chapter 15, we have a problem. It says that there were certain believers that were teaching, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. The news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church. And the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, they stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them, Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, For he purified their hearts by faith. He's referring back to Cornelius. If you remember in Acts chapter 10, this is what Peter's talking about. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Why are you trying to put something on somebody that we haven't even been able to do? Verse 11, no! Or he has an exclamation point. It's like, no! No! We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Can I get an amen? Isn't that a good scripture right there? I want to take a few minutes today to continue our series on Acts. And I want to speak on this subject, let's not make it difficult. Let's not make it difficult. Turn to two people around you, say, let's not make it difficult. Let's not make it difficult. Amen. You know, a couple weeks ago, I had a pretty incredible experience, really a life-changing experience. About two weeks ago, I had the idea that I wanted to cook for my wife, Ayumi. Yeah, I wanted to cook for my wife, Ayumi. Now, I don't want to brag, okay, but about eight years ago, I said eight years ago, uh, I made my wife what some believe to be the greatest fettuccine Alfredo that's ever been made. At least that's what she tells me. Um... But even now, my wife will remind me of how much she enjoyed that 
meal that I made her that night, and she reminds me only when she wants me to make her something to eat. Um, she's trying to convince me that I can cook. So fast forward to a couple weeks ago, my wife was expressing that she was hungry. I think we were getting ready for midweek, and uh, she was hungry, and so I thought maybe I can surprise her. You know, maybe I can make her uh, something to eat really quick. And so I'm looking around our pantry, you know, I'm looking around our refrigerator, and the only thing that I recognize is a bag of potatoes. Uh, because my, everything that my wife buys is Japanese, so I really don't know what's in there. Um, but I do recognize that there is a bag of potatoes in there. And so I'm looking at the bag of potatoes, and they look like they've been there for God knows how long. Okay, so I reach into the bag, and I pull out the potatoes, and I freak out. Because the potatoes have been there for so long that they're like growing potato trees out of the potato. You ever seen that? Like they've been there for so long, there's like little trees coming out. I'm like, what is going on here? So uh, don't judge me. I think you guys are like judging me a little bit real quick. But we all have to start somewhere. And to make a long story short, I decided to not cook for my wife that day, sadly. And uh, I know, you know, as I look back, I know I could have done it. I know I could have done it, but what happened was is that I found a recipe online. So I went online, I went, Googled it, okay, I thought I could make some potato wedges at least out of some potatoes. I mean, I think I could pull that off, right? So I found this recipe online. I started reading through all the dis- instructions of making uh, potato wedges. Just the perception of difficulty deterred me from even wanting to try. I mean, there's things on there that I had no idea what, the, like basil, and I'm like, what? I just wanted to make potato wedges. Like, anyways, so to be honest with you, I was really like concerned about a lot of stuff that really didn't even matter. I was thinking like, what do I wear? I, I want to make potato wedges. Like, what should I wear? Do I need to wear shoes? Do I need to wear an apron? Like, what do I need to do? Like, I was focused on all this stuff that didn't even matter, and the perception of the level of difficulty led me away from even wanting to cook for my wife. And you're like, Mike, why are you telling this absurd story this morning? And, I'm, and I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, that's okay for cooking uh, a recipe, okay? That's okay for a recipe, but it's not okay for our journey of faith known as the church of Jesus Christ, okay? And, and I wonder today how many people in our world have a desire to follow God. I wonder how many people today have a desire to be a part of a life-giving church, Okay, but when they start to look upon the church and when they start to look upon the things of God, their perception is that it's far too difficult. And they start having questions and they start having conversations and they start thinking about things that don't even matter. I don't understand. I'm not smart enough and I'm not good enough. What do I wear? What do I not wear, right? What do I eat? Do I, how do I read my Bible correctly? And they start getting in their mind all these things. And before you know it, it deters them from even wanting to try to know Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? Have you ever had your desire deflated? Like, have you ever had a desire for something and then just something had deflated it? Like, I think in our world today, there are so many people that whether you realize it or not, they have this desire to follow God. They have this desire to know God, but their perception is that it's far too difficult. It's too hard. You know, I think the church throughout history has done a pretty poor job on its messaging. Like we have, like the church is classic for making a big deal out of small things, right? And then we make a small deal out of big stuff. And we have a PR problem because the truth be told, we have the greatest news ever to be told. I said we have the greatest news ever to be told. It's not bad news. It's not mediocre news. It's not average news. No, it's called the gospel, it's, it's, it's one thing. It's good news. It's good news that Jesus came, that he died for you and rose on the third day. He lived a life that you can never live so that in him you could find hope and you can find life and you could find freedom. It's pretty simple. You and I were in need of saving, so God sent Jesus Christ on this earth so that we could be saved can I get an amen? Like our whole job is to be reporters. 
Our whole job is to be reporters, report the news, but it seems like a lot of the reporters that we have today, we just can't get our news right. And because of it, the cities that we live in, many people in our city, they know much more about what we're against than they know about what we are for. It was um, this great theologian, his name is uh, G.K. Chesterton, he said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting that has been, it has been found difficult and left untried. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. What's he saying? He's saying that there is this, sometimes there's this hypocrisy in the church that we project a perfection. That we have this projection like we have it all together and so people look upon the church, and although they have a desire to follow God, they see you and they see me and our projections, and they say, I'm not perfect, so I guess I don't belong here. I guess I just, I don't, I don't belong here. I mean, come on, is there anybody in this house today who would say, let's break down the barriers, right? Like, let's let people know that we are all sinners saved by grace. Like, we're just a bunch of people who are imperfect, who need a perfect God. Can I get one more Amen. That is who we are. We want to build a church that together we would say, let's not make this difficult for people. Let's not make it difficult for people. We want to build a church that we would say, it's not difficult for you to bring your friends. It's not difficult for you to come and get involved. We want to remove every barrier that is unnecessary so that people have the option of trying to get into the race. They have an option that it's not too difficult. We can do this and we're here to help you. And before you start having a debate with me inside of your head right now, like this is not my opinion. Okay, this is, this is the doctrine of the early church. In fact, we read it today, but I want to try to put some context into the text that we just read now before uh, you know if you read in Acts chapter 15 it's describing a disagreement that the early church is having they're having a problem there's a little bit of a disagreement that they're having there and I think it's always important for us to note that um, whether you're a Christian or not when there's more than one person involved there's going to be one more than one opinion involved do you hear what I'm saying right Meaning disagreements are unavoidable. I think sometimes we come into the church and we feel like everything's supposed to go, like never going to have any problem. There's never going to be any conflict. And then when there's conflict, we get, what? Right? Disagreements are unavoidable. We're going to have moments that we disagree on things. And wherever there is a will, there's always going to be a won't. Wherever there's two people that want something, there's always going to be one person that might disagree. There's challenges. There's a right way to disagree and there's a wrong way to disagree. The right way to disagree is to always make sure that you're doing so in love and you're doing so in grace. You're listening to learn, not to correct or to teach or to just throw up on somebody everything that you know and all the wisdom that you've accumulated over your lifetime. And so what's happening in the book of Acts just some history, is that Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism. In fact, Jesus was a Jew, if you did not know. So all the early converts, they were Jews. They were Jews. Now the difference between Judaism and Christianity is that Judaism has a system. It has rules. It has customs. It has rituals. It has traditions. It has steps that you must take in order to get to God. That's how it works. Jesus came on the scene, and what he did is he said, actually, I have a brand new message for you. I got a new message for you. I am the new system. Jesus said, I am the new way of doing things. And he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't get, come to, to, to get rid of what's already there. I came to fulfill what's already here. I am the fulfillment of the law. You can never keep it on your own. That's why I came, so that I can do what you can never do. Why? Because on our best day, you and I, we can never do it. We can never do it. So Jesus now says, if you want to get to God, simply go through me, for I am the way, I am the truth, 
and I am the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. I am the new system. Isn't that awesome? And so Jesus starts preaching and people start following him and all the early converts, they were Jews who became Jesus' followers. You know, they weren't even called Christians at this point. They were just called people of the way. Like, isn't that, isn't you, isn't that a cool name? Like, who are you? I'm, I'm just part of the way, man. Hey, what church do you go? I'm part of the way, church. That's, what, it's, that's who I am, the way, right? Like, I love that. They were a part of the way. And what took place is that Jews were starting to get saved, but like all of us is that many times when we come into a relationship with God, we don't realize is that it's a rebirth. Everybody say rebirth. It's a rebirth right? We don't always understand that. We don't realize that we're being born into a new kingdom. And so what we all want to do is we're tempted to do is we're trying to mix the kingdom of God with our background. We're trying to mix the kingdom of God with our culture, with our social norms, with our past. And so what happening, what was happening with the Jews at this point is that they were following Jesus. They were loving the fact that he loved them right where they were at. They loved the fact that they were being saved by grace but they would go back to the Mosaic law. They would go back to their customs and then they would try to project these customs onto all the new converts of Christianity. You know, what was also taking place was that Jesus, before he left the earth, he told us to go and make what? Disciples. He told us to go and make disciples of all nations. So Paul, the apostle, took that commission and he started preaching to people that were not Jews, okay? For all intents and purposes, that simply means Gentiles. Everybody say Gentiles. Yeah, so he's preaching to the Gentiles. A Gentile is somebody who is not a Jew. And Paul started preaching, and then Gentiles started getting saved, and it's amazing. But here is where the debate began in Acts chapter 15. This is where it all began. Paul and Barnabas are preaching, but after they finish preaching, people would go, hey, I want to follow Jesus. This is good news. This is the gospel message. I want to follow Jesus. And then they would walk out the doors and then there would be some Jewish believers that would say, there's one more thing you got to do. There's one more thing. One more thing that you got to do. And they, and, and they would say, well, well, what is it? What do we need to do? They said, do you really want to be saved? I, do you really want salvation? And they would say, yeah, we really want to be saved. They said, all right, you got to get circumcised. That's awkward. Like, that's really awkward. Like, literally, that's what's going on in Acts chapter 15. Now, circumcision, just so you understand, okay, the context for that, circumcision was a Jewish tradition. It was a Jewish ritual that was a part of their faith. And it goes all the way back to Abraham in the book of Genesis. And circumcision was a sign to remember the covenant that God made with his people, okay? The only thing is, Jewish boys at eight days of age that's when they were circumcised. They were only eight days old when it happened. How many of you know that an eight-year-old, eight-day-old, sorry, not eight-year-old, an eight-day-old baby doesn't really have much an opinion? They don't, okay? They really don't. They just kind of cry about everything. They're happy, Wah! right? Like, they just cry. Like, they're sad, they cry. Every, they're hungry, they cry. Like, that's all that babies do. So they don't really have an opinion. They don't really have an option. Are you following me? Not a lot of, not a lot of pushback when you're eight days old old just think for a moment you're a 30 year old man you're a 30 year old man you're a gentile and one day you hear the greatest news ever right jesus christ he came to save you he loves you follow him and you're like yes I want to do it I want to follow Jesus and as soon as you go amen I'm following Jesus someone right behind you goes hey line up it's time to get circumcised imagine the pushback imagine people going is this really necessary like do I really have to do this? So when Paul and Barnabas hear that, people are saying all of this, they come over and they're ready for a debate. Like they're just flat out 
upset. They're saying, we got this theological problem on our hands. You can look in Romans 2.28. This scripture I read a few years ago, and it always hit me in a powerful way. I want to read it to you really quick. Just We're going to go off Acts for a moment. Look what he says to the Romans in, in chapter 2, verse 28. It says, for you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. He's saying just because your family's Jewish and you were circumcised, that does not make you a real true Jew. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely just doing what the letter of the law is telling you to do. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Holy Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Paul's like, man, you can get circumcised and your heart cannot be any different. This is about something bigger than that. This is about God doing something in you from the inside out, not just from the outside in. Everybody's so focused on these outward things, but what God is concerned about is changing who you are. He's concerned about changing your heart. And so Paul's like, we got to have this discussion. This is a problem. So they go down and they gather all the church leaders in Jerusalem and they start having this conversation. And I love it because as they start talking about it, Paul and Barnabas, they start telling stories. Man, we were seeing these people, uh, they were getting saved over here in Corinth. We had these people over here in Ephesus. Man, they were getting saved. We had these other people over here in this city. And we're seeing guys over here and it's incredible. It's amazing. People are responding to the great grace of God. It's the greatest news in the world we're just reporting the news and people's lives they're being transformed it's awesome and the scripture says that a pharisee because even pharisees were converting to christianity a pharisee stands up and in verse five he says it says this pharisee says the gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of moses Now, I just think God in this moment is just so amazing. Can I get an amen? God is so good. He is so good, okay? And I think he's so amazing because God, out of all the people that could have been there that day, he picked the apostle Paul to be there. He picked the apostle Paul to be there. Why is that important? Well, the apostle Paul, we know, has quite the past, doesn't he? The apostle Paul has quite the past. The past. The Apostle Paul, before he was an apostle, he was known as the Pharisee named Saul. That's who he was. And what I love about God is that God will use all of your life. God will use all of your life. He will use all of your story. He will use all of your past. Some of you, you want to forget your past. You don't even want to bring up your past. God takes the past to Paul and right now he uses it. He uses it because Paul was a great Pharisee. He was an amazing Pharisee. And the best person to deal with a Pharisee is a former Pharisee, right? And what God is showing us is that every part of your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, every part of it, if you will surrender it over to him, okay, he will take all of the things that you thought were problems from the past and he will use them to bring solutions into the future, Aren't you grateful for a God who uses everything in your life? So the Apostle Paul, he starts, you know, he starts breaking it down. He starts telling stories. And then my favorite disciple, Peter, everybody say Peter. Yeah, Peter stands up, okay? Peter is my favorite because Peter reminds me of me, okay? He's jacked up, okay? He's got, he's got issues, okay? Remember, Peter was the guy that when Jesus was arrested, Peter pulled out his sword and he chopped that guy's ear off. Like how many of you know you need a friend that will cut somebody when you need them to? You know what I mean? No? Okay, a little too violent for the 9 a.m. Okay, but that's not the point of the story. I I really like Peter. So Peter stands up and he's like, you know, I got to agree with these guys. I got to agree with Peter or Paul and Barnabas. And he starts recounting a moment that's five chapters earlier. In Acts chapter 10, he tells the story of a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And Cornelius has an encounter with Jesus, 
And from that moment, God gives Peter a revelation. He says, hey, Peter, this message, this, this gospel message, this, this message about Jesus, it's not just for the Jews. It's for everybody. And watch what Peter says. This is so good. Verse 10. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the neck of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? See, this is what happens to a lot of us. We get saved by grace, but then we think that the law and that our actions are going to sustain us for the rest of our life. I want to encourage you today that the same power that transformed you initially is the same power that will transform you progressively. It's the same power that's going to continue to help you to grow and become the man and the woman that God has called you to be. You see, God does not save you by grace and then sustain you by your performance. I mean, that would be cruel, wouldn't it? I saved you by grace and now I'm going to expect you to do something that you can never do? You need grace. You need it. I need it. No, if it was grace that saved me, it's going to be grace that sustains me. I could never keep the law. So Jesus needed to do what I could never do. I needed him to save my life and to cover me. Can I get one more amen? Man, Peter's like, why are you trying to put an ounce of this law on these people? You can't even do it yourself. You can't. We couldn't bear it. That's why we follow Jesus. That's why we came to Jesus. Not because we're proud of who we are. It's because we recognize that without him, we're lost. We're doomed. Why then are we trying to project that circumcision has anything to do with these people getting right with God? I love it. I love it. He gets really loud. Acts Acts chapter 15, verse 11. He goes, no! I mean, it's an exclamation point. I don't think he's like, no. Okay, I think he's like, no! We believe. I mean, Peter's a little bit dramatic guy, okay? So he's like, no, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. I love what he does right here because he closes the gap. Peter closes the gap. It's not us and them. It's not the Jews and the Gentiles. It's it's we. It's us together. We're all on the journey of faith and we all come to salvation the same way through the grace of our God. I mean, you can imagine the tension, man. I mean, this, this, is, this is intense. And all these leaders are there and they're discussing this and they're debating this and they listen to Paul and they listen to Barnabas, Barnabas and they listen to Peter and then watch what happens in verse 12. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Everybody say James. James spoke up. Now James is the leader of the church and he is the brother of Jesus and so James is standing up. He has the authority. James is standing up and he's about to give his verdict and this is what he says, brothers, listen to me. And we're jumping down to verse 19 for time's sake. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it what? That we should not make it what? We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Listen, he's not saying that your behavior doesn't have consequences. Listen, okay, he's not giving you a license to sin. He's not suggesting that there's not a cost to be paid for following Jesus. Because, listen, if what you believe isn't changing who you're becoming, do you really believe? And if you really understand the grace of God and how powerful it is, it should be changing you. And if it's not changing you, then I would question, do you really understand the grace of God today? Peter is not trying to lessen the seriousness of sin, he's just saying it's already hard. Why are we trying to make it any harder 
for these people who want to know God. In fact, some of these men that were there that day in that discussion, they actually all gave their lives for Jesus. Circumcision in comparison to being martyred is like vacation on the beach, man. Right? What these guys were getting at is that why on earth are we creating unnecessary barriers that have nothing to do with our message that when people hear about it and when people perceive it, they're deterred to even begin and start the race. We are part of Lighthouse Church, and we want to remove every unnecessary barrier, and we want to, like the early church declare, let's not make it difficult for people who come and hear the good news of Jesus. You say, Mike, I think you're overreacting a little bit. I don't think I am. A few years, at teen, a few years ago at teen camp, as I wrap up, I, I found somebody handed me this letter. It fell out of the pocket of a teen and it just happened to be one of the teens in our ministry and as I opened it up I read the letter and I took a picture and here it is you can tell it was a freshman at the time by the handwriting Uh, dear God I would love to have a great relationship with you I hope one day I can become a disciple this was his prayer at teen camp well after that you know I reached out to him and we began to study the Bible and just began to share, you know, how much God loves them, how the Word of God and all these other things. And we started talking and unpacking it. And I remember there was this point in the studies where he just said, I don't want to study anymore. And I'm like, what? Like, I thought, I thought he had been encouraged. I thought he was making progress. And he's like, I just don't think I could do it. I, I, I don't, I just, I, I think I'm going to make mistakes. And I just don't think I can do this. And I'm going, really? The greatest news in the world? And your response is, I might make a mistake? What have we fed to people? What, what, have, what, have we, what have we turned this message into? That if someone feels like they make a mistake, they can't follow Jesus? Why is this such a big deal? This is such a big deal because people's response and his knee-jerk reaction tells me that the church is not putting out the right message. That if a simple invite to come, not to a program, but to a gathering of Jesus' followers conjures up a response, one, I don't belong there because I'm going to make mistakes, then we're doing something wrong. If a simple invite to come and hang out with Jesus followers constitutes a reaction to say, well, I got problems, maybe we're not being honest that we got problems too. I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm supposed to be a professional Christian. And trust me, I made mistakes yesterday, I'm going to make mistakes today, and I'm going to make mistakes tomorrow. I need the grace of God. Let us not make this any more difficult than it needs to be. What's the message that we're putting out that a young man who obviously has the heart and the desire to seek God, but somehow the message he has heard has discouraged him from even wanting to try? And it just makes me sad because I think there's so many people out there that have this desire, but it's just deflated. Because we don't have more disciples of Jesus who would come to terms and say, we love people. I said, we love people. Let's not project, okay, on them something that is so unrealistic that they don't even want to try. Instead, we extend our hands and say, you're invited on this journey. Come on. We can do it together. We can do it together. At this time, I want, uh, just as we close our message, I'm going to invite a very special young lady from our teen ministry to come up, and she's going to share her testimony. Everybody, please welcome Jasmine Copeland to the stage. And Jasmine's going to go ahead and share her story with us today. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Like Mike said, my name is Jasmine Copeland. Um, I'm from the Awesome Teen Ministry, and I'm an incoming senior. Um, Just to tell you about me, I was not raised in the church. Um, My parents wanted my sisters and I to be raised in a household where they, where we can find our own faith and our own path. Um, They wanted my sisters, yeah, so I did not know God, nonetheless have a relationship with him based on there was no structure. Whoops. Um, I knew there was a God and he is above us in heaven. The only really thing I knew was that I had to be good in order to get to heaven. Um, 
Because of my lack of faith in my relationship with God, when times were hard in my life, I didn't have someone or something to depend on or guide me through. I began to devote myself to the created rather than the creator. I reached rock bottom my eighth grade year of middle school. For the longest, for the longest time, I felt out of place. I didn't feel like I was made to walk on this earth. Getting up every morning was dreadful. Um, what I felt triggered this was the difficulties in my home and my school life and in my relationships. The problems surrounding me and my life led to overwhelming emotions of doubt, insecurities, anxiety, and loneliness. I had no one to turn to and I felt empty. With these emotions, I didn't know how to cope. Um, I began self-harming with the intentions of relieving these horrible emotions. But the result of that self-harming did nothing but make the problem worse. I began to come more distant and fam from family and began to isolate myself from the world and especially God. No one in my life really knew what I was going through, or nor the die express it. Um, I began to think about how, I, how lives around me would be affected if I just let myself go. Um, as I progressed, my life on earth seemed meaningless and insignificant every day. I began, um, thanks to God, I, my parents soon found out about my situation and forced me into counseling where I felt led nowhere. I still felt empty until my, my parents um, offered me to go to a local community church. And I'll never forget the feeling I received when walking into that building and listening to the worship songs. And um, although I never continued going to that church, I remember the songs that they sang and having that sense of hope and that something was there and someone was trying to reach out for me. And I realize now that the Holy Spirit was flooding through me and God was reaching out, and at Jasmine, like, come, get, come here, come to me. Um, and so I'll never forget that until, and so I began my ninth grade year of high school, um, and my going to that church became less frequent. Um, I began to get distracted by the things going on in school until my sophomore year, where I was reached out by my best friend, um, Brandon Hernandez, and the Hernandez family. And from there, I saw the love of God they had, and um, the how much grace flooded through that family. Um, I saw the beauty of the relationships in this church. I saw the joy and energy people here carried and how gracious their family was. Whether it was giving me rides to teen events or midweeks or just random encouragement, the love of Jesus they carried intrigued me to see why they were the way they were. So I began studying the Bible shortly after that. I was baptized May 21st, 2017, and I lived so long by, in a state of mind that there wasn't any more to life. I lived without trusting God or even understanding him, and I was weak. But our loving and gracious Father pulled me out of that and loved me through all of my flaws. He wanted me for me, despite any physical or mental or emotional flaws that I carried. Um, I wanted to give up so badly before coming to church, but by the will of God, I'm one-year-old spiritually, and I'm ready for the eternal God, into the, ah, I'm sorry, into the, for the eternal glory that awaits for me in coming years. God worked through people like the Hernandez family, and I would, wouldn't be where I am now, and I thank God for that. Our Father in heaven has such big plans that our minds can't fathom. He hasn't, he's not done with us and never will be. He wasn't done with me, obviously. He reaches out for us in so many different ways, especially through this church. And I just wanted to share a scripture that's always um, held to heart by me. It's in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 through 10. But the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And God worked perfectly through my weaknesses and my flaws, and I wouldn't be here without that powerful love, and I'm a product of that powerful love that God carries. And, yeah, thank you. Amen. Thank you. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, we're going to pray here in a second, and, uh, but I just want to close by saying this, that from the moment you became a Christian to your last breath on earth, you will need to be over and over again. You'll need to be what I like to call re-gospeled. 
re-gospeled. You'll need to be reminded what God has done for you in Christ over and over again. You're going to look around for the rest of your life. And you're going to see who, those who are farther along than you. You're going to see people that might have it more together than you do, right? You're going to see people who are more passionate in the Lord than you are, that maybe are more disciplined than you are, right? You will have your own struggles that you're dealing with and things that you're going to have a hard time with. But that's why we come here week after week after week because we need to remember the gospel message. That Jesus Christ died for our sin, that he rose on the third day so that we could have life. See, the truth is, I'm not going to read all this, but I do want to close with this idea here. That we're not after conformity, we're after transformation. Can I get an amen? Man can conform, but only the Holy Spirit of God can transform. And so as you go throughout your week, I have three things I want to encourage you. If you're visiting today, we would love to share the gospel with you. We would love to study the Bible with you. We've we've narrowed it down to four Bible studies we call the core four, and we would love to study the Bible with you to show you the gospel and the power of God. Uh, Secondly, I want to encourage you, everyone here, get open about the area of your life you need the gospel the most right now. Share about it. Get open about it. Pray for each other. And that's really the third one. Pray for those close to you. Learn how you can pray for them against the sin that they are struggling with in their life. And so I love you. Uh, As right now, we're going to go ahead and take communion. And let's reflect on the gospel and what it has done in our lives and how it's changed each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We are so grateful to be your sons and daughters. We thank you for your grace, God. We thank you that, that, that we get to be just in your kingdom. We know that we don't deserve it. We know that there's nothing we've done to earn that, but it's your grace and your mercy. And today, God, as we take communion, help us to remember, God, what you have done. God, if we're discouraged right now, I pray that we can remember that the power of the gospel gives us hope. God, help us to remember that this is about you, not us. Help us to respond today to that grace, to that love. God, that we don't want to abuse it. We don't want to take it for granted. God, we want to be transformed by it so that we can be more like Jesus. We love you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.